Labs are consuming and producing more data than ever before. It's becoming increasingly complex and challenging to integrate the wide range of data that laboratory automation systems need to be able to handle with data both coming in and out and data that needs to be used in real time to drive the automated workflow using both modern and legacy data formats and a variety of disparate services. The thing is, laboratory automation systems must be able to cope with this. They need to be able to collect, curate and enrich data so that we can gain an understanding beyond just the experimental results. And it's only by doing this that we then can ultimately look to accelerate research through automation. Now, in this presentation, we're going to explore how to go about designing such systems and employing strategies to ensure that no data is left behind. But before we do that, I just want to take a step back and go over again why we actually look at using automation within labs and what benefits that brings. So why do we automate? Well, you know, it starts by exploring a better way to go about our operations within the, within the lab. It's about enhancing reproducibility. It boosts quality and productivity. It ramps up efficiency. And let's not forget, it makes our lab safer and it can support the sustainability initiatives that many of us have. The aim is to blend both physical and digital automation together to integrate and as a result, run our operations much more efficiently and effectively. But then that begs the question, why isn't everyone jumping on the automation bandwagon? Because, you know, it's still a minority of people that are running automation. And it's not without its challenges. You know, the total cost of implementation um, is, is still quite high. Um, there's a lot of complexity around performing integrations. You know, f f as an example, the daunting task of managing the connection to a varied set of software systems across very diverse IT landscapes. There's still concerns around the robustness of automation. Um, there isn't that perhaps that confidence to allow it to run overnight fully unattended. We're seeing a lot of automation groups now set up dedicated teams to run in automation, making sure that they've got those right skills, both in engineering, software and science, to be able to get the most out of their automated platforms. But not everyone has access to that. The systems have a lack of flexibility and they have restricted functionality, um, which means that the science has to adapt to the automation, which tends not to work out. Now, all of these hurdles can make labs hesitant to move away from traditional methods. But the thing is, despite these challenges, there's a surge of interest in lab automation. Um, I don't think there's been a more exciting time to use or be involved in this field. You know, AI and machine learning has been around for, for years, but generative AI has clearly been the most talked about enabling technology, certainly over the last couple of years. Gen AI represents a shift in data analysis, enabling you to find much, you know, find relevant data and uncover hidden insights far easier than before. In the past, we relied very much on predefined rules and patterns, but now we can autonomously generate new data and hypotheses based on existing data sets. I think what's also been very impressive is, has been the evolution in both physical and digital automation as well. We're seeing things like um, the x -plane, the technology, these gravitational uh, parks, which allow us to actually move samples into places that we could never do before, such as directly into the deck of a liquid handler, which brings very obvious benefits as regards to uh, throughput uh, productivity. And then there's things like serverless computing, which make it far easier for us to set up uh, IT infrastructures, um, which is what we need to be able to work with all these different types of services that we encounter in the lab. All of these technologies are becoming increasingly intertwined and having a strong relationship between physical and digital automation, AI, machine learning and the world of big data is absolutely essential. And it's this interdependence. I, I see it as a game changer as each technical stride forward it enhances the others. And this leads to much more comprehensive and innovative solutions in lab automation that can only help accelerate scientific research. Now, over the years, I've seen lab automation evolve through 
advances in robotics and and in scheduling as well. However, the next leap in, in my view involves data. This means unifying in disparate hardware and software systems to streamline data integration, even within very complex systems that handle both modern and legacy data formats and services. It's about driving efficiency and enabling fully automated design, make, test, analyze cycles by ensuring all data flows seamlessly to where it's needed and when it's needed. Laboratory automation exists on a spectrum from manual to fully automated systems. So we can start off with manual, you know, being able to uh, facilitate the running of manual processes with digital SOPs, guiding uh, humans through the different actions such as, you know, pipetting or weighing, weighing samples. And this is very much suitable for labs where full automation might not be feasible or, or necessary. And then we move up to semi-automated systems that combine manual and automated elements, but often involve liquid handlers, which may include, you know, one, two, three, perhaps devices then integrated as well with a with an arm that, that moves within the liquid handling deck. We then move up to automated setups that can include, you know, transport technologies such as mobile robots uh, to move samples between the different instruments. And then we go to fully automated work cells. So we have a centralized arm, which perhaps is on a rail. And then we have the instruments uh, mounted around that arm and, and some of those instruments may be on dockable carts to allow them to be moved out of one work cell and placed into another. And then finally we have these full integrated systems where we have m multiple automated work cells creating a, uh, a very much a cohesive system and the transport technologies here could be again mobile robots but also then um, using uh, conveyors um, and, and rails to move samples between the different work cells and maybe the different storage devices that are connected to it as well. Now, the scale of these systems as we go from left to right very much is very, very different. Um, but when we design and build systems, we can break all of them down into, into three uh, common components, the data design, logical design and the physical design. Now, system design encompasses the creation of a thorough blueprint detailing the systems different components, the, the architecture and the interactions with other systems. A really effective system design guarantees that the final system is going to fulfill all of the specified requirements, including things like um, performance, um, maintainability and scalability. Now, the design process, as I mentioned uh, a moment ago, is commonly divided into three fundamental concepts, data, logical and physical physical design. Now, with data design, we're considering things like the different uh, data models uh, that you need to work with, the which represent often physical things within your within your lab, such as you know sample containers, microplates, uh, tubes, and associated with this then is all the different ontologies. We have to consider things like where we're going to store data uh, and what the design of those uh, data storage. Um, uh, systems are going to be so if you're working with a um, if you're having to generate a new uh, SQL database then there's a design aspect there we need to consider all the different uh, data inputs and the output processes um, that will come into the workflows that we intend to run and we also need to consider uh, aspects such as the data volume the data volume today but how that's going to grow and how that could vary over time and of course, we also need to consider things like security and compliance. Um, you know, logically, we, we need to be able to separate out non-sensitive data from sensitive data and, and where that's going to be stored. You know, physical separation is typically preferred, but that's not always possible. And of course, we, you know, if we're working with highly sensitive data, then single tenancy is, is typically required. And then, of course, there's authentication, authorization. And we need to consider 21 CFR Part 11 um, in, in some cases, and perhaps even GDPR, and also other things such as how we encrypt data at both at rest and in transit. When we move on to logical design, this is where we start thinking about the actual workflow. And we need to consider things like the different decision points that uh, are part of that workflow, condi conditional paths, negative paths, you know, what happens when an error occurs, and then what signals that the process is finished.
and there may be manual touch points that are within the workflow as well so we need to consider how you know that machine human interaction we perhaps want to consider also if we're running want to run our um, processes in a batchwise or continuous processing uh, paradigm we tend to lean towards continuous processing uh, these days because it's much more efficient but there's times when actually running batchwise is better for the uh, human inter uh, interface um, it's easier for someone to come along to the system and pick up a batch of plates as opposed to just always being present when uh, a plate has been uh, a plate is ready to be uh, to be moved on we also then, during the logical design, need to think about what off-the-shelf software or hardware components are currently in use within the lab that must be part of this solution. You know, how do these integrate then with the processes we've just we've just described and designed, or existing or or, or any existing solutions in use that needs to be factored into this logical workflow. And once we have that logical design complete, we then can start thinking about the physical design. So the actual devices, instruments, the uh, the robots that we intend to use, and then the infrastructure required to support these um, uh, these components. Um, we need to then perhaps consider uh, space constraints. Um, it may well be that certain devices uh, are too big to be used within the lab. It may well be that um, with the space limitations that we have, that we need to consider mu uh, more of a vertically uh, designed platform as opposed to one that uh, spans um, you know horizontally we need to look at are there any instruments that cannot be integrated in, into this workshop because of operational requirements or other factors it may be that there's preferred technologies um, certain liquid handlers may be a, a preferable for a lab or, or an entire site so we need to we need to make sure that we can use those, even though perhaps it may not it may not be the most optimal optimal solution. And then we need to think about also things such as system uptime requirements. You know, what is the required system uptime? Are there critical periods when downtime is unacceptable? Redundancy of failover failover mechanisms, um, and then disaster recovery plans as well. There's many, many different things that we need to consider. And of course, once you design each of these different components, you perhaps go back to, you know, once a physical design has been implemented, you'll go back to the logical design and refine that. So there's many things to do. Um, but one of the key things here is, is, is data. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's the generated data, um, which is, which is bringing value. And, you know, one of the most important aspects there is data quality. Now, being able to trust our data is obviously really important. And one of the fundamental aspects to this is data quality. But what is data quality? Well, it's made up of a number of different aspects, um, which we'll go through here in the context of um, a laboratory balance, something that's common in, in, in many labs. So one of the first um, things is, is accuracy, you know, ensuring that the data is error free. Does this data actually represent reality? Now, in our example, this means ensuring the balance correctly measures the weight of the compounds without errors. But we need to ask ourselves, you know, does this measured weight actually reflect the true weight of the compound? So that's accuracy. And then we have integrity, which is the maintenance of data accuracy throughout its life cycle. Now, for our balance, this means regularly calibrating the device and checking for any malfunctions to ensure it remains accurate over time. Data timeliness is a measure of how up to date data is and how available it is when it's needed for its intended use. So with the balance, it's about, about being able to access the readout from the balance in real time. Completeness um, is ensuring we've got sufficient coverage to provide uh, context. So when weighing compounds, it's not just about the weight, but also recording information such as the date, uh, the name of the compound, the environmental conditions, and any other observations for, uh, during the process. We then have relevance, which helps us. It's about ensuring that the data actually helps us achieve our objective. You know, weight measurements and associated data are useful for the uh, specific experiment we're running. So perhaps we need to know the, the weight so we can make up the correct concentration of the resulting solution for the assay we're creating this for. And then finally, this consistency. Is the data free from inaccuracies or conflicts? Standardization and harmonization are really important here. And having harmonized data 
uh, you know, recording practices is really needed to to avoid discrepancies in the in the data that we acquire. Now, the life sciences industry is experiencing an exponential growth in data, driven very much by a whole host of new technologies that are coming along and new new methods for providing scientific insights. Now, this growth presents both opportunities and challenges in managing, integrating and analysing this data effectively. You know, we're dealing with a whole host of diverse data types, each requiring sophisticated tools and systems to be able to handle the scale, the depth and the resolution of this, you know, the vast amounts of information that we're dealing with. And that also means we need increased computational power, um, which allows us to um, perform these complex analysis, but it also necess necessitates uh, a much more robust data management practice to ensure the integrity and the usability of results. So let's have a look at some of the challenges that are, you know, making it difficult to uh, integrate data and you know laboratories are generating data from various instruments and systems and this leads to fragmented information that is that is a challenge to integrate and this fragmentation creates data silos and that really hinders comprehensive analysis and traceability we mentioned a moment ago that data quality um, is is extremely important for um, establishing trust in the results that we um, that we obtain but inconsistent and incomplete data can really compromise that traditional systems often handle data in a static manner which doesn't support real-time analysis and decision making and real-time data access and insights are crucial for making timely decisions in fast fast-paced research environments that um, that we find within life sciences uh, uh, businesses. Regulatory compliance adds another layer of complexity. You know, labs must adhere to, or many labs must adhere to stringent documentation and traceability standards. Certainly if we're working something like 21 CFR part 11, that can be very resource intensive, um, requires a certain level of expertise as well. And then security and data govern governance are, uh, critical concerns, you know, protecting sensitive and proprietary information requires robust policies to prevent data breaches and ensure compliance with data protection uh, regulations. And then interdepartmental communication and collaboration can be hampered by a lack of standardized processes. You know, different departments using varying data management practices can lead to communication barriers and, and inefficiencies. Now, despite these challenges, the good news is that these are being addressed and they're being prioritised. Uh, and there is an understanding that they have to be addressed to enable us to get better scientific results. There was a um, presentation earlier in the year by um, at um, out in uh, Davos at the World Economic Forum by Vladimir Lukic, who's the global leader of technology and um, and digital advantage practice at uh, Boston Consulting Group. And he um, stated that Gen, Gen AI remains a hot topic. You know, organizations are going to need to move fast and excel at harnessing their own data, information, and knowledge holistically. And in this sense, Gen AI is a wonderful catalyst for everyone to elevate some of these perpetual data challenges that we've had in the past, such as lack of governance and quality, and really make a case for action. And I think this is something we're seeing, you know, everywhere that Gen AI is that hot topic. And if that can actually drive change and ensure that we have these uh, good um, practices in place when it comes to handling data, then that's a good thing. But there's still the challenge then of how do we go about this? And I think one of the things we can do, certainly when it comes to system design, is start trying to break the problem down into smaller you know, manageable chunks. A decoupled architecture can really simplify then a lot of the challenges that we just discussed. This approach involves separating components or services that you find in the lab and allowing them to operate independently and communicate through well-defined interfaces. 
Now, modularity is a key feature of a decoupled architecture. Systems are broken down into distinct self-contained modules that can be developed, deployed and scaled independently. Interoperability is therefore enhanced as modules communicate through standardized interfaces, you know, often using you know, rest, restful APIs or, or message queues. Now, flexibility is a real key uh, or significant advantage here, where each module can quickly be adapted to new requirements or technologies um, without major changes to the existing system. And this loose coupling minimizes dependencies between modules, enhancing system robustness and maintainability. You know, um, for example, you can test each of these modules out independently before you bring them all together. And this also uh, well, well, one of the other advantages of this architecture is that it ensures that failures in one module do not cascade to others, improving then the overall system reliability. So there's a lot of benefits to be had with following a decoupled architecture. To truly appreciate the benefits of a decoupled architecture, it's uh, good to compare it against how we've uh, gone about running laboratory automation systems in the past where we have one huge software application uh, with a monolithic architecture responsible for everything. And you can think of that entire software system as being like a single massive skyscraper where everything is inside this one large building. Uh, everything is centralized, all the offices, restaurants, uh, apartments and shops are stacked within the same structure. Now this is very convenient uh, for, the, for the user to have everything in one building and you can have you know a dedicated fast transport between each floor in the, in the build, uh, each floor in the building you know using a fast elevator. But the thing is this is very tightly integrated. So imagine there was a, a plumbing issue on the 20th floor for example. It might affect several other floors and fixing it would require navigating through a you know a very complex interconnected building. It's challenging to modify. You know, if you wanted to add a new feature like a new restaurant or a gym, it's a significant renovation project that might disrupt many other existing services. I always think of it being a bit like, you know, playing Jenga when you make a change in a monolithic architecture. You know, you take a part out and the whole building wobbles a bit, but you hope it stays upright. And it's very much like that. There's scaling difficulties as well. You know, if you imagine you needed to add more space for a particular office, you can't just expand the 10th floor. You might need to add more floors or expand the underlying uh, uh, floors or building uh, to be able to support this change. And modifying the transportation system would also be a real, real challenge as well. Yeah, in this case, an elevator. So let's compare this now to a decoupled approach, which the analogy here is, is that you'd have then the versatile town. And first of all, it's, it's very different in, as in it's decentralized. So each service, office, shop, apartment has its own small building. For instance, you have separate buildings for a bakery, you know, for a grocery store and a bank. The, any issues that come up are very much isolated. So imagine there was a plumbing issue in the bakery. It wouldn't affect the grocery store or the bank. You know, each building operates independently. It's very easy to modify if you wanted to add a new feature like you know, at a coffee shop, you could simply build a new structure without disrupting the existing ones. And it's very scalable as well. You know, if you needed more space for a grocery store, you can easily expand that building or even build another grocery store elsewhere in the town without having to touch the uh, existing buildings. Now, with both of these architectures, you can still run pretty much whatever workflow. You know, in the skyscraper using the lift service, you can go to any sequence of services or, or shops in this analogy. And likewise, you can do the same in the town. The transportation options could be different. You know, you have walk, cycle, um, you could drive there in, in your own car. But, you know, then this would be potentially slower than in the skyscraper. But the point I'm trying to make here is, is that you're not compromising on capability by going with a decoupled approach. However, the benefits of a decoupled architecture uh, for automated end-to-end -end workflows are really substantial. You get flexibility, you know, just like the town can grow and uh, change more easily than the skyscraper, a microservices architecture allows you to add um, or update features without disrupting the whole system. The resilience is is much, is far better. You know, in the town, a problem in one building doesn't bring down the entire 
whole town. Um, and similarly, a, a decoupled, mic, uh, decoupled architecture or microservice uh, architecture failure doesn't crash the entire system, making it much more robust. It's much more scalable. You can scale specific parts of the system as needed, uh, like building you know, an additional grocery store in the town. And this means you can react to needing more capacity in a much, in a much faster and simpler way. Develop, uh, speed of development is much faster. Small independent teams can work on different buildings simultaneously, speeding up construction. And, and you know, very much in a decoupled architecture or microservice architecture, teams can develop and test and deploy services independently, accelerating the development process. And then finally, with transportation, there's much more flexibility with a versatile town. As I mentioned a moment ago, you know, you can you can go uh, to the different uh, shops, you, you know, you can walk there, you could cycle, you can use the car. Whereas in a skyscraper, it's very dependent upon this dedicated high speed elevator. If that goes out of action, then you're not allowed to use, you, you're not able to, you, you're not able to get to anywhere within the building. And likewise, with an automated system, you'd not be able to run it. Whereas on a decoupled architecture with having different transportation methods, you would have a lot more versatility there um, regarding your transportation. So we've just gone over why a decoupled services approach is better than working with a software application that is architected as one giant monolith. And this decoupled approach is possible for you using orchestration. Now, orchestration goes beyond just a simpler way to integrate everything within your lab. It enables your workflows to connect different instruments across your laboratory. But Regardless of where they are, you know, whether they are standalone devices or part of a larger work cell. The key point is that the data flow is uninterrupted and the logical processing is independent of the physical locations of the devices. Now, this gives you the real advantage of having separate processes in different places, but still enjoying the benefits of a connected, integrated ecosystem where no data is left behind. Now, at the heart of the BioZero orchestration platform is Green Button Go Data Services, a tool that acts as the central hub and bus to connect services together in a decoupled fashion. It provides a platform to build upon to connect everything within your lab to allow you to manage end-to-end uh, -end workflows. Now, it's made up of a number of different services. We have order and transportation, which allows us to distribute work to different islands of automation to operate as one end-to-end -end workflow. And then we have our identities-based services, such as the accessioning service, the query service, event service, which allow data to be consumed and then collected, curated and enriched, and then integrated with third-party software like LIMS, ELNs, uh, data analysis tools. So let's go over what identities are and how they work before we'll finally look at an example of how this can be deployed on a real system that we have built at Biosero. Identities in Green Button Go data services represent object instances within the operating environment and these identities store properties for fixed characteristics. So for example we could have a an instrument identity which would store properties like the make of that instrument, the model and its unique serial number. Identities also support inheritance and parent relationships. So if we look at the example we have here on screen, we have a vial rack which is an identity and within that it has three vials, each of those are an identity as well and each of those identities contain a material identity. And what this would mean is that we could query for a particular material and it would then tell us which vial rack contains the vial which then therefore contains that material. So we get that full traceability within, with our data in the lab. The identity system allows us to add as many new, new identities as we like. And what that means is that we can represent every single physical or abstract object um, that, that we come across when we automate our workflows or, or do anything within our lab. And we can ensure that everything then is tracked within the system. Events in Green Button Go data services capture transient changes in identities over time. 
This enables a clear understanding of the current, but also the historical state of the orchestrator platform, which is extremely powerful. And events can be then recalled by using our query service. So that then gives us this real comprehensive data tracking and retrieval capability. So if you look at the example uh, that we have here on screen, again, it's using the vial rack with vials. And it's at the point when the material is added to the vial, we could have a temperature event or measurement event. But what that means is that we're providing more context to our data. It may well be that that temperature will actually influence the results later downstream. And we would have captured that information with then within data services. The event service has an API with a single endpoint. And what that means is that other non biosero products could also register events into the data services system so that when we put an, a sample onto a liquid handler, for example, the additional information that happens there within the liquid handler that typically the integrated scheduler or orchestrated platform doesn't have access to can be captured. And that additional information could actually turn out to be quite useful and relevant to results uh, determined later on. One other thing that events allow us to do is subscribe to webhooks. Um, and webhooks allows us to work with other systems outside of data services. Now, webhooks enable automatic inter application communication through event triggered actions in a decoupled fashion. So, when an event occurs in data services, a request is sent to the event listener. Um, with a payload of data. Now this reverse API approach allows systems to communicate very efficiently, sharing critical event information uh, without additional client requests, and they operate completely independently of each other. Webhooks are really then essential for maintaining real-time data flow and integration across various systems, uh, and for supporting the, this decoupled architecture, which, which we've already discussed has been really, really crucial for us to be able to um, to, to build out complex systems. So as an example, you know, if a lab detects a critical temperature change, we would have an event in data services. If we have a webhook that subscribes to that, it would then allow us to notify a uh, build, building management system or some kind of monitoring system to trigger an alert and then ensure a rapid response to any potential issues. Um, webhooks can also then be used to push data back into limbs and ELNs as well. There's many different types of applications that can be used, but this, this architecture really does give us a lot of flexibility. And what it means is that data services can work very, in, uh, very independently from the connected services that you have uh, or services that you want to connect into your automated system within the lab. So to finish, we're going to look at how Green Button Go data services can be set up to support a decoupled architecture. And this is for a system which uh, we've um, implemented, which is working together with Titian Mosaic to drive a process of cherry picking, serialization and replication of, of plates coming from um, uh, uh, an array of compounds that are presented to the system. So the first step is to get the available mosaic jobs and create an order. And what we do is we allow the user to select a job through um, our, one of our tools called Lab Experience. That then submits the order with the selected mosaic job into data services. There's some translation that goes on there where we can then create a number of job identities and source and destination plate identities. The system will then trigger the or execute the workflow. And, and that's done through our GBG scheduler tool. But as that runs, it is constantly interacting with the identities. It's never actually working with Titian Mosaic directly. It's just working with the information that, that was presented at the very beginning of the run. Every time that we complete a uh, play or part of the job, we will then trigger an event. And that event has a webhook attached to it. And it's through that webhook that we then push data back to Titian Mosaic. So as I just said, you know, every, that, what it means is that when the order is being fulfilled, it's, all it's doing is interacting with the data services system. It's never interacting directly with Titian Mosaic. And this architecture means that we can test out parts of the system in complete isolation. It means that if we had another uh, system that 
needed to do the same um, type of workflow, but wasn't working with Titian Mosaic, it was working with a different service, we would only have to change those particular services or components of the system, which is very much at the heart of why we want to use a decoupled architecture. It, it has so many benefits over a monolithic approach, which if we had to change uh, from, from Mosaic to another type of service that would require so much more effort than this decoupled architecture that you can see here on the screen. Now, as I mentioned at the start of this presentation, labs want to increase reproducibility, they want to boost quality and productivity, and they want to ramp up efficiencies as well. Lab automation can help in many ways, but only if it's backed by a solid system design that has been really well thought out, especially from a data perspective. You need a plan that ensures data quality within the lab that is capable of working with you know, many integrated parts. It goes without saying that without good data, even the best automated system is going to fail. So getting these basics right is absolutely essential. Now, by using a decoupled uh, architecture, decoupled services, it, it does really provide a good platform to work off. And I hope that we provided a glimpse here as to how GBG data services can enable that.